The following program is part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. Question. Yeah, well, well let, let's just, that's the next, you just jump my, my next demonstration here, but that's fine. Uh, what I do a little here. Oh, there it is. I have a different formulation of DDT here. This is called the green paper formulation. I'm going to demonstrate what a half light is. I mean, you're going to demonstrate what a half light is. I want each of you that gets one of these to tear it in half and pass it on. And when you get your half, tear it in half and pass it on. And just keep this going. Uh, just, you're you're going to have to go around that way there. Everybody, just just keep passing them around until you can't pass them any further. If, if you get a half, pass. No, no. Oh, what, no you just hang on. Yeah, okay. right. Hang on to one half and pass on the other half. And we'll show you what half life is. So the two characteristics of DDT, of the chlorinated hydrocarbons, are their affinity for fat and a long half life. And these both contribute to them being bioaccumulators. And that's why we have DDT in our bodies. Okay? Well, the question was the, the, the half life of DDT being about, what'd you say, 150 years? I think it's closer to like 100 years. So what we've done, so when I gave you, Nikki, I gave you a pound of DDT and you took half and passed it on. So your, your 100 years, you, you uh, lost about a, a half a pound of that. And Diane got a half a pound and she took half of that, so she's good down to a quarter and on through. How far did that one get? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, I've seen it go 11 times. I mean, you guys are not really using your fingernails here. <laughs> but after 800 years, Anita still has a, a piece of DDT that was a, applied uh, you know, from today. Okay. How, many, how many have we gotten around over here? You, got, you guys got to do better than that. I've had groups <laughs> almost get it 12 times. But. <laughs> so how did you all do? Everybody's got the eight. Okay. How many did you get, Ray? You got a little bit. Okay. okay. Well, that, 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 the half-life is how long does it take for half of the material that's applied to break down? And DDT is about 100 years. So half of it's gone in the first 100 years. Half of what's left is gone the next 100 years on down. DDT has been around about 60-some years, right? Which means that some of all of the DDT that's ever been applied is still around. Why not carry some of it around in our bodies, right? You, you know, it, it's, it's very pervasive. It's in every animal, every plant. You can find traces of DDT. Uh, and every part of the earth that people have explored have been able to find traces of DDT. So it sticks around a long time. That's a good reason to be cremated. It's a good reason to be cremated. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Release your DDT back into the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I live in an agricultural area and actually surrounded by orchards, uh -huh. you know, sprayed by helicopter mostly, and it's it's constant. I can watch it come over into my yard. How how carefully is all that monitored? Okay, good question. Uh, when you're living in an agricultural area and you're being exposed to a lot of the stuff being sprayed. And how carefully is it being monitored? If living in California, you're pretty lucky because we are the most highly regulated place in the world for uh, monitoring and, and for regulating the use of pesticides in agriculture. Uh, California is the only state that has a system of agricultural commissioners like we have next door who have people on set. These are our regulatory agencies for pesticides, the, the ag commissioners. Who they have in this uh, county and probably six or seven people working here whose job is to go out and to monitor the pesticide use in agriculture. Question in the back. There are some organisms that begin to metabolize DDT 
Right, yeah. There are, there are organisms that, that break down various different types of you know, bacterial organisms that will do that. But let me, let me finish this one question here with the, the, the regulation. Um, I, I ask because I watch the farmers mm -hmm. spray, and I have prunes, um, walnuts, peaches, I can't remember what else. But anyway, all around us, I mean, we live right. in an area, when we built our home, we had to acknowledge that we were building an agricultural yeah. yeah. land, and we couldn't complain about what was, what was going on. Yeah. And, um, well, you can't complain if it's done illegally, and so well, you have some rights. You know, they, they don't have any kind of protective clothing on. They're just out there spraying, and I really wonder about it, and if they're using good practices. Yeah, well, there, you have every right to go to the Ag Commissioner and, and express those concerns, uh, because that's what they're out there for. The, the Ag Commissioner can't be everywhere all the time, and so they're, they're uh, not able to monitor every application. But one, one thing California does require is that a grower who uses any pesticide on his farm, before they can even purchase that, must register with the Ag Commissioner's office and get a grower ID number, no matter what they use, Roundup, Safer Soap, BT, uh, because they cannot legally buy a pesticide for use on that farm without having a grower ID number. This must happen every year. You must re-register every year. And then uh, the, the, um, every pesticide they apply on that farm has to be reported to the, the Ag Commissioner's office within the, by the 10th of the month following the month where it was used. So they have to file a report every month if they use pesticides, where it was applied, you know, how much was applied, when it was applied, you know, that type of thing, how it was applied. And what about leaching and groundwater? We're all on wells. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't characterize all pesticides as being able to leach in the groundwater. DDT will not leach into the groundwater because it ties up in the soil very quickly. Certain pesticides are called leachers and they have a propensity for really going down to the groundwater. So there's a variation depending on what they use. Uh, and typically, they've identified leachers in California, certain materials, mostly are herbicides, and those areas where they have actually caused contamination in the groundwater, that there's a requirement that before that material can ever be used again, that the person that, that, that's using it has to have a written recommendation from a licensed pest control advisor who's taken special training, and they have to make these reports and all this other stuff, so basically, very much controlled. The very first place they found pesticide contamination in groundwater was in the city of Commerce in Los Angeles County, which is not an agricultural area. It was all uh, industrial residential uses. Is there a website that you could go to to uh, say material safety data or uh, information on pesticides? A website. Okay, uh, very good question. There is a website. I, I don't know the name of the website, but if you search for xtoxnet, E-X-T-O-X, NET, you'll be given a, a website that's at the uh, uh, Oregon State University. It's supported by the US EPA. It's a collaborative effort between the University of California Davis, Oregon State University, Cornell University, and one other, and I can't remember what the other uni university is, but there's four universities involved in this. This is toxicological information. You'll just search for the, the pesticide that you're interested in, and if there are any health studies on that, you'll get it brought up just like that. There's also a phone number that you can access on that site if you have information. If you want to talk to a real live person in English or Spanish, you can get information from them. <coughs> Question. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask if you could address that railings <coughs> issue again. Okay. They're 80% or 90% pesticide free. And we're talking about other countries using pesticides <coughs> that maybe are not approved here, but by the time they make it into this country, they're not really present or, present or detectable in our food. So does that mean that the food that we're getting in is truly safe and the issue is really more that they're polluting their own country or are we being misled? Well, of course, every banana that comes into the country or every orange isn't inspected individually. Uh, so they take, take lots when they come in, they'll do a random sample of those and, and inspect them. We can't guarantee that every piece of fruit, Rayleigh's can't guarantee this either, that every piece of fruit in the market has been personally inspected by somebody because you destroy the fruit in order to do that. They have to chop it up and run it through a whole bunch of tests. So they just take samples, random samples of this stuff and if they find, now, it's not a problem to have detectable pesticide residues as long as, as those things are below the, the limited tolerance, okay? Uh, if, if a 
of the say diazinon, is approved for uh, use on prunes, which it is. Uh, you can use diazinon prunes, you can sell those prunes, and you can detect diazinon on those prunes, but it has to be below a certain level that's been established as being a minimal level uh, for protection of, of people. Um, so it's impossible with our detection methods not to find anything that you, know, you may find DDT on those prunes, you know, or, or something else that's never been used on it, but just because it's in the atmosphere. But the, so the detectable levels are kind of arbitrary. But uh, so as long as it's registered for use on that and it's below the de below the, the uh, residue level that's been established, the tolerance level, it's legal to sell it. Now what Rayleigh's has done is taken the, the stuff, they have their own lab, and they, they look for detectable levels and they don't find them. And it doesn't mean that they weren't grown with pesticides, it means that by the time it got to Rayleigh's, the, the, whatever could have been on there isn't detectable under these standards right so now. do you go to the grocery store and buy organic vegetables or fruits and things? I mean, when you go out? No. You don't? No. Sometimes we do. My, my wife uh, shops at the Davis Food Co-op. We, we live in winters, and so we don't, you know, if we sometimes buy food in our, the local market, which is just normal. But all produce goes through some type of inspection, lots of it. Uh, but that means not every piece gets inspected, but all lots have to be inspected before they can go on the market. The USDA, the, the Department of Food and Agriculture, do this inspection in California. I Several think questions. Have been worried about the residue. Yeah, and, and basically you said they're, they're residue, as long as it's acceptable. Well, right, residue now... Isn't, residue isn't the pesticide itself, is it? Well, it could be, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Detectable uh, parts of that pesticide. There are... Uh, the part of this detection will show that this prune has a, a pesticide on it that's not registered for use, and so that lot has to be rejected. Or that the tolerance is above it. And I think the latest figures I've seen is about 95% of the material coming through for inspection is accepted as acceptable levels of, of whatever is on, or no detectable levels. 5% are rejected. And the, it's interesting that organic produce sometimes falls into that. Remember, organic doesn't mean pesticide free. Organic growers use pesticides. We'll, we'll point that out here in just a second. Yeah, recently somebody returned California rice and then they fixed it. Mm -hmm. And it, it had uh, detectable residues and or over tolerance residues. What was the result of that? I don't know. They haven't solved that. Yeah. My question is about half lives. You know, for drugs, you usually think about after three half lives, you don't have any effect. So, is that? the same for pesticides? Well, of course, a drug, you're taking uh, a certain amount of, of, you know, and it's broken down, and, and oftentimes the half-lives are very much shorter than that. Mm -hmm. With DDT, after 100 years, you still have a half a pound, of, you know, if I applied a pound now, in 100 years, you have a half a pound left, it's still toxic, you know, it's still active. So 100 years later, you have a, a quarter of a pound, and 100 years after that is an eighth of a pound. It's, so if you pound, you know, just think about that hundreds but of pounds. If it were applied appropriately in the concentrations <coughs> that were recommended. Not necessarily. You no. Still end up with that no, no, I understand that. But, yeah. but that's different. That's a different yeah. um, cycle. If something were appropriately applied in <coughs> the right concentration, then after three half lives. No, it has nothing to do with that. It, it has yeah. something to do with the efficacy. The, the concentration is the efficacy on controlling that pest. Right. Uh, copper is one of those things that we're getting really concerned about, and organic growers use a lot of copper. And copper is building up in soil in organic farms to toxic levels to soil organisms because it doesn't break down at all. You know, it just stays around. Okay, okay we're going to start talking about pesticide illnesses and injuries. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that a pesticide illness or injury could be many different things. Uh, California is one of the few states. It requires mandatory reporting by a physician if they see uh, anybody that's been, has been or suspected of being injured by a pesticide, no matter what the injury is, it could be a skin rash or something like that. Unfortunately, all of our physicians in the state don't know that law yet, and so we're trying to educate them. This law has been in effect for many years, but uh, still a lot of people don't know it. and, and don't, it's often very difficult to associate a pesticide-related illness if somebody goes to a doctor. And also, many people don't go to the doctors when they've been injured by a pesticide. So we don't have 100% accurate uh, recording of the pesticide illnesses and injuries. 
But anyhow, we do have some information. The Department of Pesticide Regulation keeps records. When, when I say it has to be reported, the, the, uh, if, you, if you injured yourself with a pesticide and uh, went to your doctor, he's required by law to report this to the county health official, uh, the, the health department, within 48 hours. And also, usually a complimentary report gets sent to the Ag Commissioner's office. But even if it doesn't, the, uh, the health director has to forward that report to the Department of Pesticide Regulation here in Sacramento. Sacramento tabulates it, then sends it back out to the county in which it occurred. And the Ag Commissioner's <coughs> office in that county, so it would be right next door, they're responsible for investigating that illness or injury to find out all the information they can. And if there were a violation of a pesticide-related law, then the, you know, the, the the people responsible for that illness and injury would be dealt with. So <clears throat> since 1990, uh, 1982, we've been reporting pesticide illnesses and injuries. And this isn't up to date. Uh, they're usually a year or so behind in sending out the, the information. I apologize. I'm two years behind on, on this. Uh, but my, my chart is getting a little bit too small. Uh, but between 2,000 and 3,000 reports are sent into the Department of Pesticide Regulation each year. Now, all of these don't come from uh, the physicians or the county health departments, the, the Department of Pesticide Regulation actively looks at workers' compensation claims. And if, uh, you know, even if the physician forgot to report it, if it were a workers' compensation case where an employee on his job, as part of his job, got injured by a pesticide, they screen all of those reports, so they're included in this too. So they have, you know, they, they check from both ends, both from the physician reporting and from the workers' compensation claims. What they find. Uh, I'll just go through this. The, uh, this kind of crosshatch bar up here are the, the reports, once they receive them and they do the investigation, they, they find that it's unlikely related to being a pesticide illness or injury. Uh, so there's, there are uh, many things that cause skin rashes besides pesticides. Obviously, things like poison oak, certain crops people are working in. Uh, become exposed, you know, cause skin irritation. So sunflowers is really bad for that. People working in sunflowers get a lot of skin rashes. Uh, so anyhow, the investigation has shown that that certain percentage, you know, almost probably a third, quarter to a third of the, the reports that actually come through are not, are determined not to be related to pesticides, even though the physician thought it could be. The uh, green bar here is the ones that they can't classify. There's not enough information. It was suspected to be a pesticide illness and injury when the Ag Commissioner got the case, we went to investigate, the people were gone. You know, there just isn't enough information, so they can't classify it. It's called unclassifiable. This little light blue bar are the non-occupational ones. These are homeowner uses uh, or people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, jogging through a field when they're getting sprayed or something like that. They're not, it's not part of their occupation, but they become injured and they get re reported to the doctor and it's called non-occupational. It seems like there's one or two deaths within that group each year. And it's, it's very interesting. They all seem to follow the same pattern. The, the person that dies from the pesticide exposure is somebody who has uh, you know when they, they fumigate a, a, a house for termites, they put this tent over and pump in the gas. And um, to do that, the, the company that's performing that operation must lock out everybody out of that house. They put special locks on the door so even the homeowner or the, the apartment owner, the people can't get into that. They put big signs you know, and they pump the gas in. There's a, there's a group of people that sees this as an invitation to go in and rob the place. <laughs> So uh, once or twice a year when they take off the tarps, you know, and they, uh, if you, they, they ventilate the house, they'll go in there and they'll see some guy lying on the floor dead with a VCR under his arm. <laughs> That's classified as non-occupational, but you know, probably is an occupational hazard for burglars. But, uh, uh, do justice. <laughs> do justice, okay. There was a case, uh, I think two or three years ago, down in the, the uh, LA area where the guy was having his own home fumigated. And uh, they locked him out and they put the tin, put the stuff in there. And he had this date that evening and he remembered he left the keys to his Porsche on his dresser. So he broke into his own home and they found him the next day with the keys in his hand and he was dead. Uh, uh, to the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Porsche survived. <laughs> so anyhow, that, that is one small amount. So these are 
uh, non-occupational, and uh, probably most of the ones that often get reported that way are children who, uh, you know, get exposed to pesticides. You know, improper uses of pesticide storage or something like that. Just Question. out of curiosity, 1991 has a really big peak. What happened that year? Uh, do you remember the uh, tank car that went into the Sacramento River? Oh. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And the antimicrobials used that. Well, now the antimicrobials is a is a reporting artifact. There, uh, they started, you know, reporting all of. Uh, I think it started in 1987 when uh, the uh, requirements for you know California has this requirement that all employers must train their employees regarding pesticide use if they handle pesticides. Most of those cases occur in restaurants and bars, dishwashers and they splash the Clorox solution into their eyes. Antimicrobials are things like Clorox and, and other materials like that used for uh, germ control. State law requires that all dishes in a commercial establishment must be rinsed with a 10% Clorox solution. And, that, and how many times have you gone into your local bar and seen the uh, bartender washing glasses behind the bar wearing his prote personal protective equipment, which is required? <laughs> Eye protection and rubber gloves, you know? Uh, it doesn't happen, so. Uh, but they, they started reporting those as part of pesticide illnesses and injuries at that time. Now you also see that there tends to be a, a trend coming down starting in 1991, 1992, 93 and 94 they started dropping. 1992 was when the, the Federal Worker Protection Standard uh, took effect in, well, it, it didn't really take effect until 1995, but it, it was written into law in 1992 and people started getting used to it. Uh, and they were starting, there's a lot of efforts to train people uh, how to protect themselves from pesticide exposure, both from our, our project at the university and the uh, Ag Commissioner's offices, the enforcement agencies. 1995, you see a big peak. Well, 1995 was the year that we all went out and started training healthcare providers on reporting pesticide illnesses and injuries, and they started reporting more of them. So we, we think that that's what's happened. We, we can't really tell, but there were more reports. But no, I, I don't think they stopped. I think we're still continuing that downward trend. We're, we're actually getting fewer and fewer. We're, there's a lot of, just tremendous amount of effort training people on how to protect themselves from pesticide exposure. The worker protection standard, especially, made a difference to the field workers because it, it, it requires that anybody working in a field that's been treated with a pesticide within the last 30 days must re receive information, they call it training, I call it information, on how to protect themselves against pesticide exposure by wearing long sleeve shirts, washing your hands, and you know that type of stuff. Um, it's legal for them to be in the field, but if it, if it had been sprayed within the last 30 days, there still may be pesticide residues that they could be exposed to. So hopefully that it's having some effect. Okay, so we've, we've talked about the antimicrobials, the uh, uh, unlikely unrelated, the unclassifiable, and the uh, non-occupational. And the rest of these are occupational uses of pesticides that have been confirmed. I think in 1998 there was, uh, well it looks like here there's less than about 400 actually confirmed uh, occupational uses. Now, now the, uh, the yellow bar up there is also, you know, the antimicrobials is an occupational use too, but in agriculture primarily. It's not just in agriculture, it's, it could be uh, home care, uh, you know, lawn care services that are using pesticides as part of their occupation. Uh, an apartment owner may hire somebody for that apartment to apply pesticides around the apartment to control weeds or cockroaches. That's an occupational use. Um, Emergency uh, responders, people who uh, drive ambulances or, or whatever, go to a, uh, an accident where pesticides have been, been involved are included in that group. So those are all occupational uses. Uh, California is the only state that requires this so far. Uh, Oregon is starting to, to look at that, but you know, we're, we're way ahead of everybody. Typical symptoms of pesticide poisoning. I, I did mention skin rash. I don't have that on here. Uh, that's, that's one of the more common, or, or irritation of the eyes. But things like headache, blurred vision, nausea, uh, stomach cramping, dizziness are, are possible symptoms of uh, pesticide poisoning. There are also symptoms of other things, hangovers and you know, flu. <laughs> Uh, you know, so there, there's a lot of things. It's very difficult to, from a, a symptom, although it, it indicates something's wrong and uh, you should see the doctor. I mean, if you've been out spraying pesticides and you develop a headache, you ought to go to the doctor. 
because that's probably related. Well, uh, there, if, if it's like an organophosphate material poisoning, uh, there are some, some drugs that can be administered that will counteract that. Uh, if it's very severe, they, they do atropine, they use inject atropine as an as antidote. For Any questions in, about uh, illnesses and injuries? Well, on your handouts, that, that orange sheet that I, that I brought, I just discovered that yesterday it was a news released by the, the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, and it talks about keeping pesticides away from children. Now, you know, we're all given a brain, and I, and I just can't understand why people would want to put pesticides in food containers, and to just imagine that anybody would even do that, but it happens, unfortunately. I get, I collect little horror stories. There's some, some horror stories in that news release, and, and I, I hope you share those with everybody to try to make people aware that you don't put pesticides in food containers. There was a guy in Fresno County, maybe three or four years ago, who uh, worked on a farm, and uh, he didn't want to spend the money for Roundup at, at the Walmart, and he, he found that the boss had a big jug of Roundup and knew he wouldn't miss it, uh, that he'd been spraying around there, so he thought he'd take some home with him uh, just to, to use around the home that weekend. So he, he uh, got himself a container, and he filled it with Roundup. It looks like Roundup, doesn't it? I told you it was Roundup. Uh, yeah. uh, they're about the same color. So he took it home with him, set it, uh, he had a back porch, he set it on the back porch, and he was going to use it that Saturday. This was like Wednesday or uh, Monday or Tuesday, I guess it was. So Saturday he rolls around, he gets all ready to go spray his Roundup and goes out on the back porch, it's not there. And so he said, asked his wife, he said, did you see the, the Roundup that I brought home the other day? She said, well, no, I didn't see it. He said, well, it was in this Wesson oil bottle, and she turned white. She just panicked. It appears that she had been cooking some meals in this cooking oil. And, then, and she, of course, she immediately had sense enough to call the Poison Control Center in, in Fresno, and, and uh, there were no ill effects, fortunately. It was one of those cases where, you know, it, everything turned out all right, other than your spinning what, $80 a, a gallon for <laughs> cooking oil, but... Uh, that chart it was one of the lesser... Right, was right. Towards the bottom of the chart. Yeah. It took an awful lot, really. It would take a lot, yeah, but I mean, just the, the, the concept of it, yeah. yeah. There was a principal in a high school in San Francisco several years ago who the janitor was doing some weed control around the, the school grounds, and I think it was like something like 2,4-D. And he said, you know, that stuff really works around here. Why don't you bring me some of that in? I could take it home with me. So later on the day, the principal brought it in and set it on his desk. And, uh, you know, as principals do, they, they have to talk to these unruly students, you know. And so a, a guy got called in, a young, uh, unruly young man was called into the principal's office, and he was being properly disciplined by the principal. But the principal got called away to a phone call. The, in the middle of this conversation. So, of course, this kid, you know, sees the Pepsi on the, the table and he gulps it down. And that didn't turn out so well. Very, very seriously injured just by, you know, such a careless thing to do. So, it happens. And, and I thought, you know, we've been educating people for years now. Never do that. And then I get this news release from March 7th of this year, relating a couple of stories where people have put pesticides in food containers and kids have found them. And uh, it really makes you think, doesn't it? We talked a little bit about regulating pesticides and, and like I say, pesticides are ready. Now remember, if, even as a homeowner, if you're using pesticides, you fall under these regulations. You just probably don't get caught. Uh, you're not quite as obvious out there, but everybody is required to use pesticides according to the law, uh, all pesticides, and uh, that's really important to know. But we do have, uh, here again, that this state of Mississippi has one person who regulates pesticides in the whole state. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's probably why uh, some of the, um, I don't know whether you read the, the news a few years, a 
well, maybe about two years ago, where in Mississippi and in, actually in Illinois, they were having some problems with structural pest control operators applying methyl parathion in houses for uh, cockroach control. Boy, it really works on the cockroaches. Uh, methyl parathion has an LD50 of about 0.5 up here. I mean, it's a little more toxic than aldicarb. Um, and it's used for you know, crops. It's an organophosphate nerve poison. It has a short half-life when you spray it on cotton, but when you put it in your house on your carpet, it sticks around for a long time, and people were getting ill. They discovered that the people, you know, it's a restricted use material. It's a, you know, it's got caution, poison, uh, I mean, it's got danger, skull and crossbones, poison on the label, and it's really a toxic material. Um, and it requires a, a, a certified applicator by the, the federal law, a certified applicator is only one that can purchase and, and uh, apply it. In Mississippi, to become certified, um, there, you have to watch a video, <laughs> and then you take a little quiz and you become certified. There was a, the guy that, that watched this video and it was doing this was deaf. So he didn't hear anything, but he watched it, watched it and he, he became certified, which allowed him to buy this methyl parathion. And, he was spraying it in homes. It's cheap. It's it's cheap material, and it's certainly effective uh, for cockroach control. Well, you know we are generous taxpayers, and right now you're buying new houses in Mississippi, new carpets, new walls, and uh, entire new houses. Federal government has used some of your tax money to to um, correct this damage that was done by some of these people who were not properly using materials. California, you know, in order to buy. Uh, something like methyl parathion, even if, we're, if it's no longer available here, but if it were available, you would have to go to the Ag Commission. You have to be, a, first off, you have to study this book and take an exam, become a certified private applicator if you were a, an individual, or you'd have to buy this book and take an exam to be a certified commercial applicator just in order to use the material. But before you did that, then you'd have to get a restricted use permit from the Ag Commissioner that shows the site. Um, and, and at the time of day, and, and you have to file a notice of intent of applicating, uh, making that application within 48 hours of the application. So there's a good chance that by the time you're out there making the application, the inspector from the Ag Department will be out there watching you, especially if it's something like methyl parathion. And then you also have to report its use. So we do, we have, uh, of course we have the, I don't know whether you've been downtown and seen the, uh, the new EPA building downtown, uh, the Joe Cerna building. Three floors of that building is the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Just people regulating pesticide. Three floors of that <coughs> building. Um, I don't know how many hundreds of people work in there. And then every county has, you know, five or six ag inspectors that, you know, some counties have 20, 25 ag inspectors that are out there monitoring pesticide use in those counties. They're the cops. And they do have the ability to pull out a little thing and write you a ticket on the spot if they see a violation. They often work with growers to try to educate them rather than, than uh, giving them violations. But a repeat offenders certainly do get uh, violations. You do have a chance to appeal it if you feel that you've been unfairly ticketed, but there still is, is that process. And they can stop the whole procedure. Oh, they can stop it, yeah. If, if, if you see so, uh, uh, something being sprayed at the time, I mean, th th this is your right, to, this is where you go for if you want some help. Something's being sprayed and you don't like the way it's being done, call the Ag Commissioner and they, they will come out, they will respond. And if they agree that there's, not, there's something wrong, they can shut down that operation right there. So we are, we're, we're a very highly regulated state. Like I, I always tell people, we're, we're more highly regulated in California than any place in the world as far as pesticides are concerned. And some people don't think that's enough. And maybe it isn't. But it's certainly better than the average. Uh, we have a lot of people actively out there monitoring all kinds of pesticide uses. Homeowners fall through the cracks. In, in most cases, they fall through the cracks. So, which is unfortunate. And the times are changing, and that may not be forever either. So there's some... Yeah, that, that's one of the restrictions. You know, the, the reason that the homeowners lost the use of diazinon was because of their improper disposal of the material and overuse of the material and it's finding its way into the waterways. And so they've, just, they've actually realized that it's homeowners that are most responsible for that contamination. Although most of the diazinon in the state is used by farmers, but it's the homeowners that's causing the contamination. So. Uh, they did ban the use of that, and they're, they're, they're certainly restricting the use of it in, in agriculture, too. 
The law of the land, for as far as pesticides are concerned, is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, and we fondly call it FIFRA. Uh, it became a law in, uh, when was it, 1947, and it's had several amendments along the way. This 1992 one was the one that required protection of workers, the Federal Worker Protection Standard. One of the things that they required at that time with the Federal Worker Protection Standard was that people who handle pesticides, even though they're not certified, must be trained by their employers every five years. Well, California folks started, oh really, that's really interesting. Like, they kind of laughed at that. California says we train all commercial, or, you know, people who are handling pesticides in commercial areas, employees, yearly documented training. We have written training records. And if an ag commissioner for, comes out to your place to, you know, to do an inspection, the first thing they want to see is your training records that have to be kept for two years. And if you don't have them, there goes a ticket. You know? uh, 1997 was the uh, FQPA Food Quality Protection Act. That's changed the, the way residues are, are being monitored on pesticides. They actually gave People, uh, uh, there was studies saying that that uh, uh, individual can be exposed to so much of this pesticide in a lifetime, 70-year lifetime, and so you've got a risk cup uh, that that uh, would represent your total lifetime exposure to each one of these type pesticide groups. So the organophosphates, you know, for everything that you would do, they, it's the first time ever they included non food use of pesticides. So this is pesticides used on your pets, in your yard, in your drinking water, you know, uh, the, the chlorine in your drinking water, all this other stuff that's, that's being used as pesticides. So for each, like the chlorinated hydrocarbons, you have a risk cup uh, that the, the total amount of this pesticide that you can uh, be exposed to in your lifetime. And if the, they, they go through all the calculations, all the crops that this pesticide is, is registered for all the uses that it's registered for, like uh, diazinon and home uses and things like that. And if your cup starts running over, they have to cut back on some of the registrations. One of the things that's done in California is hurt California because California grows minor crops. We have 350 minor crops. Now, Cal a minor crop in California is grapes, almonds, walnuts, you know, prunes, you know, all of these 350 crops that we grow. The only major crops that we grow in California are cotton, wheat, maybe a few soybeans, uh, you, know, you know, those types of crops are called major crops. That's where most of the pesticides are used in those major crops. So a chemical company has to reduce the, the, the risk up for the individual. They're going to cut out the uses in minor crops, not the major crops. They're not going to uh, cut out the use on cotton because that's where their market is. So they're going to cut out the use in uh, strawberries. It's the same insect. So, you know, so we we're losing that. Or they're going to cut out the homeowner use of these materials. So a lot of the pesticides are, are, that have been available to people are being restricted because of this Food Quality Protection Act. It's there to protect people from pesticide exposure, though. So you know, it's a two-way street. Um, so it, all, all forms of regulation of pesticide comes out of this federal law. Each state must comply with that law. They can be more restrictive, but they cannot, that's the minimum standards for each state. Uh, and this law is administered, administered by the US EPA. Uh, and you know, they, they, they file a plan of work with each state, an agreement on how this law is going to be upheld. California goes way beyond most of the provisions of this law. Our, our, uh, we, we adopt this law into the California Code of Regulations, but we also have other requirements, such as the reporting of pesticide use, the reporting of illnesses and injuries. These are laws in California that are not part of that federal law. Do you think there's any weakening of the EPA uh, law that affects this administration? Do you, say that again? Do you think that there are any weakening of the uh, EPA laws with this particular administration? I hear that. Okay, the, the question is, are these laws being weakened the, there is some tendency to, from the EPA's own administration to, to reduce their enforcement of the laws. Their enforcement part of EPA is being cut back. But that doesn't affect California because we have our own enforcement. So uh, it, it doesn't, it, it may affect Mississippi, but it's not gonna affect California, you know. Um, I've, I've been working very closely with, with the Office of Pesticide Programs in EPA in, in Washington, D.C., and I'm finding that they're very, very concerned 
uh, you know, about, and, and part of some of the things I've been working on, and I'll be talking a little bit about that in, in a little bit, uh, are uh, recommendations to in, in strengthen these laws and to make, make more amendments to this FIFRA to make it uh, more, more restrictive for the use of the pesticides. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Who's the head of EPA here? Not the uh, government. Christine Whitman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So does OSHA get involved in this in the state of California? Well, no. Uh, usually, because there there's different laws, uh, OSHA stays back when it comes to pesticide. Department of Pesticide Regulation is the lead agency. Things like respiration, respirators, uh, you know, things like that. OSHA has standards for respirators, but Department of Pesticide Regulation also has for pesticides. And so, if an OSHA inspector comes out on a farm and you know, they don't, they don't address pesticide respirators, if, but they do address dust respirators or you know, toxic uh, paint respirators, whatever that is, they'll address that. So there is a little difference there. The enforcement agency for all pesticides in California is Department of Pesticide Regulation. And that's delegated out to the uh, county ag commissioner's offices. Well, the main thing when you're using a pesticide is to read the label. Everybody say that. Read the label. Okay. The label is the law. Okay, all right, that's your mantra. <laughs> it is illegal to use a pesticide inconsistent with the label, any pesticide. Now, it's awfully, when you pick up the, the Roundup bottle here, I don't know whether you've bought things like that, they have a little pocket here on the side, and they've got a 78 page booklet in there which is called the label. This is not the label. So 78 pages of label there. I noticed you don't have yours anymore. No, they never came with one. <laughs> uh, but, but it is very important. All the information you need to know to properly use that pesticide is really on that label. It may not be in very big print, and it may not be in plain English, but it's there. And there are a lot of efforts to try to standardize labels and, and to make them you know, easier to read, but that information is there. Uh, I've got an example of a label here. This is fire ant bait. Uh, there's, there's many things that are on the label that are really important. First off, there, there's requirements that you cannot use a pesticide unless the site where that pesticide is going to be applied is on the label. The pest doesn't have to be on the label, remember that. If you want to control ants by using Roundup, you can do that. It might kill your plant and get rid of the ants, uh, but it, you know, it doesn't have to be on the label. But the site, you know, whatever plant or crop or site, site being in, in your own uh, homes, being your ornamental plants or your around your home, whatever it is on this, it has to be on the label. If the site isn't on the label, you can't use it. There. Okay. Um, so he, these are the sites here. Lawns and other turf areas including sod farms, recreation areas including golf courses and playgrounds ornamentals and landscapes and nurseries and greenhouses. Those are the sites. So if you're going to use this material, it has to be in one of those sites. And I, you know, it says it's for fire ants, but you might think, well, well, we'll try it out for potato bugs or something like that. You know, it Maybe it'll work. You can do that, but you can't, uh, if that site isn't on there, you can't do it. Obviously, the really important thing is the signal word, caution. What does that tell you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the least toxic uh, area. So it's, it's not really hazardous. Uh, there are precautionary statements on here. And there's some very important information in your precautionary statement. It tells you what personal protective equipment that you need to wear when you're applying this. This one says, uh, non-worker protection standard uses, any, any, stand, any use not covered by protection. There are no specific PPE requirements for applicators. So you, don't, you can go out there in your bathing suit and wear, apply this if you want to, if you're crazy enough to do that. There's a difference here because you notice there's agricultural use requirements and uh, non-agricultural use requirements. So if you, if you are in an agricultural use, uh, if it's covered by the worker protection standard, uh, you have to wear long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes plus socks and waterproof gloves. 
California law is in all commercial uses of, of pesticides um, has a minimum personal protective equipment requirement. And that is, it, no matter what the label says, if, it, if, if, uh, if it's not, uh, nothing is listed on the label, you still have to wear eye protection, rubber gloves, long sleeve shirt, long pants, and shoes and socks. Mm -hmm. Minimum for anybody handling pesticides in a, you know, for, as part of their job. Mask is required as a regular? No, no, only, only if, uh, respiratory protection is only required if the label requires it, okay? Um, so that, that we do have, you know, homeowners can go out in their bathing suits and apply this stuff, but if, if you were hiring somebody to come onto your property to apply this, they'd have to wear the, the mis the, whatever's required on this label. Um, there are also directions for use, which are very important. How to use the material properly. So those are the parts that you have to read. You'll also find that uh, this is the other part of the, this is a two page thing. Well, I noticed that you did not um, address active ingredients. In many instances, we are uh, asked to ask a user to read the active okay. ingredients. Okay. I see that. I don't know what spell that is. Right. And I'm sure that the uh, everyday person would know. Well, it says right there, it's a mixture of spinosin A and spinosin D. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need to know? <laughs> What is it? Uh, you would have to go to a reference book. Uh, one of these books would, would tell you what that is. These things, uh, yeah, give that information. Uh, there are, uh, you could also look it up. There's a lot of information on the internet anymore about pesticides. You can look these things up on the internet. Uh, I couldn't tell you what it is either. Um, very important part is the first aid information, environmental hazards that, that uh, is on the label. There always has to be first aid information on the, the pesticide label. And uh, you know, it's, uh, environmental hazard says it's, to it's toxic to aquatic invertebrates, so don't apply it directly to water. Can I ask a question? Sure. Questions for use. They never tell you how to use it. <laughs> I don't know whether to put that in my spreader to hand broadcast it to dissolve it in water and spray it, I have no idea. Directions for use are useless. Yeah. They're all like that. Is that EPA regulation? Well, because there is no requirement to tell you how to uh, apply it. Uh, if, if there was a restriction, they would tell you only apply it with, mixed with so much water. I mean, otherwise, you can use it, you can apply it in any way you see fit. Well, Unless it's dangerous. Huh? This, this is a granular material. Yeah, that's got to go. Say on the front, um, the pesticide on the front label. This is the front label. Oh, okay, that is. It's it's a turf professional turf project. Um, there are more information on the back of the label: storage and disposal, and. Uh, well, there's application. Yeah. There's temperature requirements. Cups per hundred per thousand square feet. So it's a broadcast application rate. So you you'd broadcast this through probably a, a, a granule spreader of some sort. Okay. Well, there are ways to prevent our exposure to pesticides. Even though you think it's safe, it's got the label caution, you know, and there's no personal protective equipment requirements. Don't believe all of that. You can always wear, you know, the law doesn't say you, you can't wear more protection than, you know. And that's the biggest problem, I think, especially people around homes forget to wear the proper personal protective equipment. Now, we protect people who are doing this commercially. The state law says they have to wear rubber gloves, long sleeve shirt, long pants, and eye protection. But uh, many times, like with that amp aid, no gloves were required. You could go scatter around with your hands, right? Didn't say you didn't, couldn't do that. So I brought some PPE, and I realized when I unpacked that I forgot my rubber gloves, so we'll just have to pretend we have rubber gloves. But I need four volunteers to come up and model some PPE for me. Well, I, I'm dressed properly for most requirements. It says long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, and socks. So you know, I, I'll model that part. <laughs> 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 All right.
Okay. Well, these, these are two two things that homeowners could easily use. Uh, you know, cover just plain coveralls like this to cover your clothing, or these throwaway. These are one-time use throwaway uh, disposable garments. Uh, they cost three or four dollars. Uh, well, any place that sells chemicals would, would sell them, but I think I've I've seen them in places like uh, yeah. no, it's not it's Tyvek, it's Tyvek, and it's it's a non-woven material, and so it's pretty strong. Except it usually breaks out in the crotch and after a few hours of really use here. Uh, <laughs> but for commercial uses, especially these things are very handy. The throwaway ones don't require laundering; you just throw them away. There's no requirement if, unless they've been contaminated with. Con with concentrated material, there's no requirement for washing them before you throw them away or anything like that. So when you wash, say you use uh, coveralls and you wash them uh, afterwards and you throw your tennis shoes in and everything, can you be pretty sure that all that stuff okay, will wash off? Yeah, usually if, if, it's, if you don't uh, contaminate with concentrated material where you get a spill of something over your pant leg and down into your shoe, it can be washed in a washing machine. Wash it separately from other, other laundry. Uh, the the recommended recommendations are use the highest water level setting, the longest wash cycle, and the hottest temperature. And use liquid detergent, if possible. Liquid detergent seems to be a little more effective than uh, other detergents. And if possible, hang the clothes out to air dry in the sun because the sun helps to break anything down or you can use it in, a, uh, in, the, in the dryer. But keep it separate from other laundry so it doesn't cross contaminate. What if you have spilled it? If you spill it, it's a, it's a hazardous waste. You need to dispose of it. Uh, and don't wash it. Uh, there was a, a case in a manufacturing company. Come here with the blue coveralls over here. Uh, a case in a manufacturing company. It was manufacturing parathion that, that the workers in that company were wearing these kinds of coveralls. And there was a spill uh, for this one worker. And it, it got through the, the cloth into his skin. And it absorbed through his skin. He was rushed to the hospital in very serious condition. Three days later, another employee in that company came sick and was rushed to the hospital in very serious condition, but there wasn't a spill. And three days after that, a third employee became ill. Somebody said, you know, something's going wrong here. So they started looking at it. And they, they found out that the first person's coveralls were sent to the commercial laundry and washed and brought back. And they contained enough material to make put the second person to the hospital. They were sent to the laundry again, came back, and they still contained enough of the material to put a third person in the hospital. So you can't remove a concentrate spill. You cannot remove from cloth. Uh, well, so you're, I, saying if, uh, you're talking about if you have round up of and it, it spills on you. The concentrated material. The concentration that we buy as homeowners. Probably. That it would be. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what concentration it is. How much active ingredient is in there? At least the forty-one percent. That would definitely. You, I would throw it away. Yeah. yeah. The Hasselhoff team screwed up on that. Yeah, <laughs> they did. Yeah. But th these are good because you don't have to wash them. They, they are thrown away at the end of the day. They won't last more than a day, but they certainly are very effective for protecting you. And because it's, it's a non-woven material, thank you for the camera. <laughs> because it's a non-woven material, it takes longer for liquids. <laughs> here you go. <laughs> Let's give him a hand here. here. We forgot to, to model our eye protection. There are, there are several kinds of eye protection. These are real cool. You know, you can uh, look really cool when you're out spraying. You can wear them over your glasses. You know, aren't they, aren't they neat? Yeah. Uh, they have to have the, the brow pieces and the side shields to be legal for commercial use in, in California. But if, if the pesticide label just says eye protection, uh, you can wear these if it doesn't specify. And of course, I said that the minimum requirements for commercial uses is eye protection. So these things work. People like them. They're comfortable. Uh, it may say goggles. And so if it says goggles, you can't wear those. You have to wear these. Uh, this is one of the, the uniforms that people wear, you know, these cloth hats. But uh, one of the, the problems with this is if you get pesticide on this, it, it's constantly exposing your head. And they've done some studies, actually, 
uh, they found some volunteers in a prison in Colorado a few years ago, well, about 20 years ago, to do some studies on uh, pesticide exposure. And they were using parathion again, which is a, you know, a readily absorbed through the skin. And they, uh, they got these volunteers to allow them to put a measured amount of pesticide on various parts of their body. And then over uh, a certain period of time, they measured the amount that was excreted in their urine or the byproducts of that so they could tell how fast and how much was absorbed through the skin. And uh, they found that the forearm was the least absorptive part of the skin. And uh, around the head and, and face, it was about six or seven, eight times more absorptive than the forearms, the skin up here. But the, the, the men in the, the prison who had it applied to their scrotum, they found that the scrotum was 12 times more absorptive than the forearm. So, you know, just... So I always tell people when they, when they wear these hats and they get pesticides on them and they put the hat, it, they're, they're increasing their chances of exposure because you, you get this stuff as cloth that absorbs pesticide. So if you wear head protection, those, those hoods on the, uh, the Tyvek are neat or they, you can get these plastic uh, hats. Yeah. It has to do with blood. Yeah. Okay, cleaning goggles of glass. One of the, the important things is not to scratch the lenses. They can be washed in, in uh, just soapy water, uh, so, sort of like ivory soap or something like that. And it, usually you don't have that much contamination. It's just like the, the laundry, uh, the water from the washing machine. Uh, but going back to the washing machine, if you do use a, it, what we instruct people commercially who have employees who take their clothing home after, uh, uh, you know, if it's their long sleeve shirt, long pants, or coveralls, and, and will launder them is that they, they wash it in the washing machine separately from the other laundry. And before they use their washing machine again, they run another cycle full of water and soap, but no laundry in it, just to clean out the washing machine. It's just a, you know, uh, it's a requirement for commercial uh, uses to do that, just so that there are no residues left. Well, the residues are then handled, hopefully, by the uh, sewage They're diluted enough, yeah, to, yeah. I mean, that's why you don't concentrate on material. I mean, for normal application, you aren't drenching yourself in the pesticide. You just get residues on. Most of uh, the requirements aren't to wear rubber boots. But, uh, you know, there, I heard of a story. I thought I had two left feet here, but I don't. Uh, uh, of a, there, there's a, a group of herbicides called the um, sulfonyl urea herbicides. They're very active. It's small. It's just a couple ounces per acre. And there was a guy out spraying this all day. Uh, he got into his truck at the end of the day, drove home, walked across his lawn, went in, hugged the kids, and, and went in and took a shower. Three or four days later, there were some dead footprint marks on his lawn that he walked across. And you know, because this stuff is so active at the, this uh, low rate, it showed up. But that doesn't mean if you're spraying Roundup, you get, you're bringing in the same amount of Roundup into your house, into your truck, and on your shoes too. And do you want this on your carpet, and you're in, in your truck, or your car, or whatever? And you, so I always tell people when they're applying pesticides, just to wear rubber boots. Because you can wash them. Just take a hose and a brush and wash them off. And you are tracking this stuff. You're leaving it out with your other equipment that you're applying pesticides. And you're not getting it under your shoes. Because you can't throw your shoes. You can throw tinnies usually into a laundry. But uh, you, know, you, you can't show, if you've got leather shoes or something like that, you can't throw those in the laundry. They can't be cleaned. So it's really a good idea not to use regular shoes for applying any type of pesticide. When you're talking about disposing of either the disposable overalls or if you have a concentrated spill, what's the proper disposal? Can you sort your trash? Can you? I think so. For, for normal use, when it's, when it's contaminated from just normal use, it can be thrown in the trash. If it's, concentra if it's a, a contaminated with concentrated material, it's called, considered a hazardous waste. Homeowners, again, kind of slip through the cracks. Uh, a commercial person would have to treat that as a hazardous waste because you've got spill on the ground, too. You've got to clean that up and decontaminate that. That stuff has to be put into a container, a sealed container, and shipped to a hazardous waste disposal site. And you can't take it there yourself. We have one in California, Kettleman City. Um, and you pay people to haul it because, huh? It has to be manifested. It has to be manifested. And they don't dispose of it, really. It's not a disposal site. It's a storage site. It's there with your name on it forever. 
Yeah. Round up occasionally. And I discovered that the small bags that go in trash cans or whatever with the tie top, put the foot in there and tie it up. Sure, something just to, yeah, that's great. Any way to keep the, the they make material. Sure yeah, any way to protect, yeah, they, they have, even you can buy these Tyvek booties too, or you can buy the uh, Tyvek with boots in them. Uh, so, yeah, the only way, you know, anytime you dispose of a pesticide, uh, homeowners are allowed to, to put contaminated material into trash containers, but most uh, commercial cannot do that. Uh, the other thing when you're handling pesticides that's really important is personal hygiene. When you get through, take a bath, take a shower, get washed up, get the stuff off your body, wash your hair, just so you aren't carrying around the pesticide residues. Because exposure is time related too. The longer the stuff is on your skin or on your body, the more chance you are of absorbing it. Now not all materials absorb through the skin readily, but certainly uh, you know, we, we don't know all that information. The other thing, you remember I showed you all the, the pesticide illnesses and injuries there? thing it wasn't measuring there was the long-term health effects of some pesticides. We don't know that. It's very hard to, to monitor that. If somebody sprays something for a couple of years in their life and then 15 years down the road comes down with some disease, we don't know whether that really was associated with this disease because so much time has lapsed. So many other exposures and, and potentials for exposure have taken place. So we don't really know all of that. They can't test that on animals. They can assume, you know, if, if it causes cancer in rats, they can assume that it's a carcinogen and may cause cancer in people. And so th we know that. And so we take precautions to, to, to avoid exposure to those types of materials. But we don't know what the long-term health effects of being exposed to Roundup is. Nobody knows. And so the only thing we can do is protect ourselves from exposure. So treat all these things as, you know, they're poisons. They're, they're foreign chemicals, just like any other, I mean, if you're, working with benzene or formaldehyde or something like that. Those, those are chemicals that you don't want to expose yourself to. So personal hygiene is, is really an important part of it. I, di I didn't talk about the respirators, but if you want to protect yourself, th these are now considered respirators as far as EPA is concerned. They're, they're listed on the, the label as, a, as a, an approved respirator. For most, when, when respiratory protection is required, this is the, the type in when, any one of these. They have to have two straps on them, these little single strap. They call them, used to call them dust masks, but they're not even called that anymore. They're called nuisance masks, are not suitable for pesticide application. But these, these are, if, uh, if the label does say a, a dust and mist filtering respirator on it, these would work. If it says a dust, mist, and organic vapor filtering respirator, you have to get these things that look like you know, spacemen with the, the cartridges on them. But I, I wouldn't expect any of you to be using those. Very few of the, the pesticides now require those any longer. Uh, these, these work. And one of the reasons they don't require them any longer is because it, it requires special fit testing, a lot of maintenance, and people get careless and wear them around their neck. And these are easier for people to wear. And the Department of Pesticide Regulation here in California did some tests on that and found that most of the exposure, respiratory exposure, was from dust or mist and not from the vapors. And the only time now you're going to be seeing pesticides that require a vapor filtering respirator is if you're working in an enclosed areas. If you're working outdoors, uh, usually these things are they're required. Where do you get those? Uh, a lot of hardware stores will sell them. Most, most hardware stores are Walmart or, or uh, Hammond Museum. Yeah. The single strap. Well, you you look around and you'll, they're more expensive. They're probably twice as expensive, but uh, they're there. Paint departments, yeah. As long as they have the, the two straps. The, the little nuisance masks. Now we tell people what is a nuisance when you're wearing when the people are working in uh, grape vineyards and a grape leaf hopper flies up your nose. That's a nuisance. <laughs> so you can they can get use it for that. But. Okay, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about organic agriculture because there is a misconception that because people grow things organically, they are pesticide free, they don't use pesticides. And I hope everybody realizes that organic agriculture can use pesticides, but there are only certain types of pesticides that they can use that are approved for use in, ag in organic growing. These are often naturally occurring compounds that uh, uh, 
often break down pretty fast, don't hang around. Although I, I mentioned copper is one of those. It's a naturally occurring compound. Organic growers use a lot of it. And it doesn't break down, and it's building up to in some, you know, apricot orchards that, that have been farmed organically for 20 years are getting some pretty high levels of copper in the soil. So uh, there is, you know, always reports out of how much pesticides we use in California every year. And uh, this is the top 50 that was, were used in 1998 in, in total pounds. There were, uh, in the top 50, there were 192,842,436 pounds of active ingredient applied in these top 50 pesticides. Roundup is number six. The ones I've outlined in green are organic materials. They're used by organic growers. And you'll notice that sulfur is our number one pesticide used in the state of California. Not all people using sulfur grow organically, but it is approved as an organic material. And 78 million pounds of sulfur were applied in this year. Uh, some of that obviously was by organic growers. And uh, the, the second one down there is our oils. Petrol they're called mineral oils, but they're petroleum oils. Th these are the dormant oils that people use uh, naturally basically naturally occurring materials. Number three is copper hydroxide. Copper. Uh, number 10 is calcium hydroxide. Number 11 is cryolite. Uh, number 29 is copper, copper sulfate, basic <coughs> copper sulfate. And number 35 is lime sulfur. You mix those two together and you get Bordeaux. What about the paraquat that's on there? That was highly poisonous. Where, where is it? Is 22? It's, it's, no, no, the only, the green ones are only ones that are used, that are used organically. So, what it, <clears throat> of the top 50 of that 192 million pounds, 116 million pounds of that use was, or 60% of those top 50 are organically approved pesticides. The pink, I just put down there because it's chlorine. I wanted everybody to understand that chlorine is a pesticide. And it's ranking number 49 in the, the state with 422,000 pounds of active ingredient applied. I just wanted to point out that you know, chlorine is a pesticide. So from the actual usage, <coughs> uh, more than half of the top 50 pesticides used in the state are approved for organic agriculture and are being probably actively used in people who, by people who are growing organically. Now going back to our illness and injuries, it, we, we had a question come up here earlier, which is uh, the most toxic pesticide in toxicity being used, but the one that's causing the most injuries. Which do you think is the pesticide causes most injuries in the state of California? Sulfur. Sulfur is the most hazardous pesticide in the, used in the state if you rate it by the number of injuries it causes. And because remember, sulfur, if you get it in your eyes, sulfur dust in your eyes, or you inhale sulfur dust, you turns a little bit of that turns into sulfur, sulfuric acid, and it really burns. People that work with sulfur and they sweat, they get this burn around their neck where the, the sulfur mixes with the sweat. It, would that be true if you um, equalize the number of pounds each? Right, absolutely, yeah, because it's the most widely used <laughs> pesticide. Yeah. And so you would expect it to be the most hazardous because it's most used. I mean it's it's uh, you know, pro a little less than half it fifty percent, probably thirty-five percent of all the pests the active ingredient applied is sulfur in the top fifty. It's certainly not the most hazardous as far as toxicity to people, but it causes the most reported illnesses and injuries. Which one is most toxic to people? On here, methyl bromide is number four. Methyl bromide is an odorless, colorless gas. It's very fatal. What is it? Methyl bromide, number four. It's a fumigant. It's what the, the, the slide that I showed that, that had the, uh, 
um, field covered with the plastic. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what is the other someone here that are... Chloropicrin in number eight is kind of interesting. Chloropicrin is tear gas. Uh, it has some insecticidal activity, but it's used with methyl bromide because methyl bromide is odorless and colorless and you can't detect it. So they mix it with, with tear gas so that you know it's there. Right? Well, paraquat number 22 is pretty hazardous material. At 2,4-D down here is number 48. Let's see. Most of the really toxic materials don't show up there. Well, methamsodium, sodium, actually number three, methamsodium. sodium. That's what fell in the, in the Sacramento River. Bapam, it's called. Okay. The, the type of equipment that's used to apply pesticides varies depending on the, the, what you're trying to apply. I brought my little handy backpack spray. Somebody want to try this out? Who wants to put this on? It's empty. <laughs> Need a volunteer, come on. Okay. And here's a, so you can, now these, these have never had pesticide in, but you know, to operate this, you pump this handle. Uh, if it had water in it, it would start spraying out there. There might be a little water come out. There. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's for fairly large areas uh, is, is a, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. We do a lot of training uh, for people, you know, uh, safety training on, and handling pesticides. And we had a group of people from EPA who make these reg regulations come out, and we put them through one of this training. And half the people wouldn't touch any of our equipment because they didn't want to be exposed to pesticides. And I thought, what are you thinking? Do you think we would actually expose people to pesticides in our classes? You know, we, 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 don't, we don't even own a pesticide, you know? And none of our equipment is ever applied to pesticides. So it, it's just, just demonstration. Yeah. Uh, and and to, to have them think that they were going to be exposed to pesticides and how stupid we would be, I don't know. But anyhow, uh, this is uh, very, very typical. It's the last one down here, the backpack sprayer. Uh, the very typical piece of equipment. You can buy this at, uh, I don't know, I've seen them at uh, different stores for about $100. The simplest thing we have on here are the little spray cans you buy, you know, the, for the ant spray. These are pressurized cans, ready to use form formulations, aerosol cans. Uh, and that's the simplest way. When it gets empty, you throw it in the trash and get rid of it. The next simplest are your hose-in sprayers that you mix uh, some pesticide in a jar and then it's diluted as you spray it through the hose. Uh, these little trigger pump sprayers, I think some of the, the ready-to-use Roundup comes in the trigger pump sprayers. And then you have the little compressed air sprayers, the little canisters that you pump up with, with air in them and, and it compresses the air. And you don't have to pump those all the time. You, you build up a pressure the backpack sprayer. And then a very specialized one is this wick applicator down here. It's just a, a tube, hollow tube, that's got a, a curve on the end and a little rope in there and you put Roundup in and you just wipe it on your weeds. You don't have any spray at all, it just wipes. Some growers use this, they have large ones that go on tractors that's this rope that goes through a pool of the, the uh, pesticide, it's usually an herbicide, and it wipes it onto the, the plants as they drive through with their tractors. I'm going to rush through this last bit here, so we're running low on time. If you're applying dry pesticides, they, mostly the, the top two, three uh, ones are used by commercial applicators, little little duster, the dust applicator that the guy that comes in and treats your house for ants will, will squirt some dust into the, the uh, wall plugs and light switches and, and inaccessible places using the little squeeze thing. Or the compressed air duster, I showed a slide of a guy using that uh, underneath the house. Uh, there's a power duster which has got a little Briggs & Stratton motor, straps on your back and it throws the dust out. Uh, but if you're applying granules, uh, Remember when you buy your, your weed and feed from uh, the, 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 the garden supply store to kill the, the crabgrass or to kill the oxalis in your lawn, you're applying a pesticide along with that fertilizer and you probably would use one of these like the, the uh, mechanically driven spreader or what they call the belly grinder. This is a, the one that straps on the front of you and you walk along and you, you, you 
crank the handle and it spreads the stuff out. And they have a, a similar version that goes behind tractors here, much larger. It's important when you apply pesticides using a piece of equipment to calibrate it properly, and I can't go through all the process of calibrating because it's different with each sprayer, but there are certain things, there's, there's uh, four things that you have to measure. If you're doing liquids, you have to measure the volume of the tank. Now it says on here that this is uh, three uh, gallons. But that doesn't, don't, don't believe them when they say it's three gallons. You, you want to physically measure this using some sort of a calibrated uh, piece of equipment, you know, uh, uh, some sort of little jug with, with accurate calibrations to find out what really it says when it says there it's three gallons. Because we've tested, it's not quite as critical with these small sprayers, but when you get into a 500 gallon sprayer, you may be off 50 to 75 gallons one way or the other when you fill it up to what they say it's supposed to be just because of the stuff inside. This has stuff inside too. It has a little air chamber and it has a pressure regulator. So there's, you know, maybe that three gallons doesn't take into consideration all the stuff that's inside this tank. So first off, just measure the, the volume of your tank. You also have to measure your travel speed, how fast you're walking or traveling if you're going on a, a sprayer. And you can, you can measure this off with a stopwatch and measure off a distance and find out how long it took you to walk 100 feet or whatever distance you want to do. And you have to measure the swath width, the width of the spray that you're spraying. If, you're, if you've got one little nozzle here and you're walking along and you're, you're uh, going back and forth, you have to measure how wide that is so that you have some sort of a, a, a width that you're actually spraying. So you have to know how wide that is. Then you have to, you know, have to measure how long does it take to what is the output from this nozzle. So you take this calibrated container again and you take your stopwatch and you, you pump it out into this calibrated container for 30 seconds or something like that. And so it tells how many gallons per minute you're able to, to spray out. And then there's some calculations. The gallons per minute times the distance that you're traveling. Uh, and then knowing how long it'll take to do, spray a tank tells you how much pesticide to put into that tank. Uh, and that's a very brief and I'm sure very confusing uh, lecture on calibration. If you want details, buy the book. Because it gives you all the... <laughs> I'm sure every homeowner does it. Oh, I'm sure they do, yeah. But it's illegal to apply more pesticide than what it says on the label. So if you, it's never illegal to apply, uh, apply less, but it, it always is illegal to apply more. You can never apply more than the rate that's put on the, the label. So that's very important. And when ag commissioners come out to farms, they check the calibration of the equipment and make sure that they're not applying too much. Because if you overapply, you lost your crop. Question? I have a question about cleaning up the residue from sprayers or hose things. They always say to get rid of it, but they don't say where it's safe to do that. But the safe place to do it is at the place where you sprayed. It's the only place you can do it. That's, that's a legal site for that, that application. If you, now remember, only mix up what you need. You don't want to pour out a half a tank full. But if you're rinsing out your tank, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. dump it where you've, where you've sprayed. It's perfectly legal. They do that in, in, uh, commercially in, in agriculture. That is the legal place to dispose of the, the, the wash water from uh, cleaning up equipment. When you rinse out your containers, that's another thing. These things have to be triple rinsed when you empty them. Put that in your spray tank. Use that to make up the water in your spray tank. You fill it at half full, stir it around, drain it, do that three times. Then this has become just an empty pesticide container. It's not a hazardous waste. They, they have a, a large recycling of empty pesticide containers. Uh, companies that, that come around for, for growers, you can take these things. They have to be triple rinsed and often inspected by the Ag Commissioner, and they can be recycled. The plastic can be recycled. And don't be alarmed, they don't come back as baby bottles or consumer products. <laughs> they come back as pesticide containers or some of these roadside barriers and things like that. What's being done to reduce pesticide use? This is uh, the key to get some more slides up here. I'll show you a few things that are happening. I'm sure when Mary Louise Flint was here, she went through some of these things about uh, what's being done to, to prevent uh, the use or to reduce the use of pesticides. And of course, this is a pheromone trap. Uh, that little rubber septum in the middle, if you see that, is impregnated with a pheromone. And the sides of this trap are covered with a real sticky thing, uh, sticky material. And so the uh, insect that you're trying to monitor 
uh, it thinks it's finding a mate in there. It, it's usually the males that are looking for females, and the females send out these pheromones so they can be found. I mean, you think of yourself as a little tiny insect in a huge orchard or a huge, huge world somewhere, and how the males find you. They use these pheromones, and uh, then uh, th what is this? This does is show when mating activity is taking place, so that the proper control measures can be taken at the right time, so you don't waste the use. If you're going to use pesticides, you don't put them on at the wrong time. This is a person checking a pheromone trap in a walnut orchard for the codling moth. The codling moth is a serious pest in apples and, and walnuts, and uh, they use the pheromone traps to, to time control applications. This is the same pheromone used as a twist tie in a peach orchard, and this is used to confuse the males. Uh, you know, the male comes roaring in there, thinks there's a lot of females around, and they can't find them because every tree has three or four of these twist ties impregnated with that uh, pheromone, and they are unable to find their females. They're unable to mate. The ma females can't uh, lay eggs if they can't mate. The only problem is everybody in the area has to be doing it because the, the mated females from the, the other orchard isn't, you know, who found a male can come over into your orchard and lay eggs. It doesn't keep them out. So. And of course, the biological control is, is one of the things that's really being emphasized. This is a, a parasitic wasp attacking a caterpillar on a, a plant there, laying an egg, and, that, and the egg will hatch out and consume the caterpillar. Uh, beneficial, such as, as uh, honeybees, are trying to be protected. There's laws that protect them from uh, pesticide sprays. Oftentimes, people who apply pesticides have to notify the beekeepers in advance so they can move them out of there. Spiders, of course, are your natural enemies of many different insects. They're not selective, but uh, they control a lot of insect pests. Just physical barriers. These little tree protectors are, are not only for sunbird protection, but they keep rodents from chewing on the barks of the trees. And you know, so it's just a physical barrier. There's other physical barriers, like this little ring around the bottom of a tree that keeps rats from climbing up the tree and nesting in the tree. Window screens on our houses are physical barriers we use to keep out mosquitoes and flies and spiders and other things. Lids on trash cans, of course, is a barrier to flies and it's a pest management tool. Uh, draining standing water is a really good way of reducing mosquitoes. Trapping, my cat didn't like that very much, but uh, uh, trapping for, for larger animals and relocating them is a, a, certainly helps to avoid having to poison them. And those of you who cross the border into California from time to time get stopped at the border by the uh, Department of Food and Agriculture, and they're looking for exotic pests. Uh, they may take your apples away from you. They'll ask you where you bought them, and I'm sure all of you have gone through this indignity of having your fruit taken away from you. But it's a pest control measure. It's a prevention. This is one I, I thought I'd just talk to finish up on this one about. This is a uh, uh, almond orchard in. Uh, January in, in this area, and you see it's foggy. It's, a, it's in the northern Sacramento Valley, and the guy's out there knocking off the, the mummy nuts off the trees with that long pole. And actually, that, that mummy nut is an overwintering site for the navel orange worm, which is the worm that infests the almonds and destroys them. And to control navel orange worms, it requires a couple of two or three sprays during the growing season because they have several generations during the year. Uh, and often the, those sprays are so disruptive to the natural enemies that, that about two weeks after you spray for the navel orange worm, you have to spray for mites because it builds up the mites. It kills all the natural enemies of the mites. So a grower may put four or five sprays on during the growing season if they've got navel orange worm problems. They've discovered by just going out with this long pole during January, knocking those nuts off the ground and then disking them under or mowing them, eliminates most of those sprays, if not all of them because the overwintering navel orange worms can't survive that being knocked off the tree and disked under. And so therefore they're not there, you don't have to put the sprays on. So you not only have not have to put the, the sprays on for the navel orange worm, you can eliminate the sprays for the, the mites that you've disturbed. So that's a simple uh, mechanical practice. Okay, last few things here. Turn off that projector. Got about three minutes and I think I can do it. I just wanted to point out that in 19, uh, last year, 2001, in January, we, we had a new law in the state called the Healthy Schools Act. Do you, anybody know what that's about? It's requiring each school district to, to have an IPM coordinator 
and to have an IPM program for uh, controlling pests in schools. If you have children in school, you'll probably have received notification from the school that they may from time to time be using, using pesticides and they're informing you of that and what your rights are as far as removing your children from the school and what knowledge about the pesticides that are being used. Anybody here seen notices from their schools about this? Really? Oh, you have, okay. You have. Uh, Department of Pesticide Regulation is the lead agency on that. They have a website if you wanted to look at more about it. They have a lot of information and, and they're developing this, uh, these plans to provide training to anybody that's applying pesticides in schools. Uh, this especially applies to teachers who like to bring in their can of raid when the classroom has ants in it or something like that. They don't think of this as being a pesticide application, but it really is. Just That's just a point of uh, information. This is another one. It's in September 11th. Uh, there is a real concern about pesticides being used by terrorists. And I've been involved with some meetings with, with EPA making recommendations to them. We, we met in January, a committee from throughout the US to uh, look at possible ways pesticides could be misused and be used as tools for terrorists. And we came up with 42 areas that need to be looked at and regulated. Uh, and so these recommendations were turned over to EPA and they in turn turned them over to the, the director of the new director of Homeland Security and we don't know what's going to happen. But one of the more important recommendations was that people must show a demonstrated need to purchase pesticides. This guy in Mississippi who was buying the methylparathion, uh, he could have been buying it to throw into a reservoir or something like that or to you know, do something disastrous with it. So uh, that is something that is, is really being seriously considered and hopefully will further restrict pesticide use and keep it in the right hands. Uh, rather than getting, allowing it to get in the wrong hands. Because these are dangerous. If you think about what would happen if somebody dumped a bunch of stuff into Folsom Lake, for example. You know, it's just unthinkable. That would mean that a lot of the, the homeowners, sellers, would no longer be carrying. Well, of course, the quantities are different when, in homeowner sales. But the, part of the recommendations are to, to train people who are selling uh, pesticides to homeowners and uh, require some sort of competency testing for those people. The preceding program was part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. It's the Definitive Guide to Gardening, produced by the University of California. The California Master Gardener Handbook contains over 700 pages of in-depth information on topics such as soil, fertilizer, and water management plant propagation, weeds and pests, lawn care, landscape design, home vegetable gardening, and the wide variety of garden crops that are grown in the Golden State. The chapters in this handbook provide helpful information on selecting varieties, planting, growth cycles, pruning, irrigation, and harvesting. The California Master Gardener Handbook is available along with other gardening publications on the ANR Catalog website at anrcatalog.ucdavis.com dot edu